Anytime we engage in some kind of self-help kind of thing, it actually is a coping mechanism to deal with some negativity within us. So I saw that Dr. K was back on that Stephen Guy show, what's his name, Diary of the CEO. And there's one section in it I thought we could talk about because it's something that I've talked about before on stream, but I just hearing it from Dr. K is so much more helpful, I think, about sort of the obsession we have with self-improvement. One of the reasons I dislike being miscategorized as self-help is because I don't identify that way. Like people saying, oh, do you think it's wrong that you're taking calls from people when people need therapy is their fault for miscategorizing me. I just want to fund my content and I'm happy to give my time for an hour to talk to people to do that. But I'm just a YouTuber funding her content. I am genuinely, obviously not trying to be your therapist. If I was going to be a therapist, I would have been one and I would have been a great therapist. But I don't want to do the emotional labor needed to be a good therapist, right? So like, I don't want to do that. So when people miscategorize me in this way, it's only to the, like, like it's not to anyone's benefit, but especially not to their own because they're missing out on an opportunity to one, enjoy the content and two, to learn how to judge people accordingly. The reason we're going to redo Manifestel is because I want to make sure I'm judging her accordingly. Maybe I'm losing out on an opportunity to really enjoy someone's content, or maybe I was right and she's not for me, but it doesn't mean she's not for someone, right? So Dr. K is going to go over this idea of our obsession with like self-help, and self-improvement. And I want to talk about it because I think it leads to a lot of stagnation when I hear people say like, oh, I've read these 10 books and I've done these things. And you can kind of tell they're reading all of the material, but they're not doing anything with the material. Like they're not learning. And I want to talk about why that's important. That's why when you guys ask me like, what book should I read? I don't want to give you an answer because it's the self-help dilemma. It's the catch 22 of the self-help bubble. If I give you a book, it will change your life. But that's not true because you're not me. So a book that I love that changed my life won't change your life because it's not the book that changed your life. It was you reading the book and you hearing something that connected with your brain that changed your life, but it wasn't the book. So that's the reason I definitely hesitate with sending you guys content that changed my life because it, I just don't, I'm not convinced it will help you. Right. With that said, let's look, let's let Dr. K kind of explain it a little bit better. Right. If I touch, if I tell you, Hey, Steven, don't touch that, that pan, it's hot and you touch the pan and you burn yourself, you won't listen to me. Mm -hmm. But the moment that you touch it and you get burned, suddenly your behavior will change on its own. We learn through experience. But if you look at the way that most people try to solve their problems, it's not through experience, it's through information. Oh, I have a problem, let me buy a book. I have a problem, let me listen to a podcast. Let me watch a YouTube video. And this is what we see, right? There are literally millions, if not tens of millions or hundreds of people, millions of people out there who are gaining a lot of information about change, but aren't actually changing. It's wild. And, and that right there, I think is so important where, see how when you guys ask me like, what book should I read? You're falling into the trap that I see so many people fall into. If I just read the right book, if I just get the right podcast, if you what? If you live your life, you have to live your life. That's why I say like introspection, like people ask, can a five get to introspection or can a person get to introspection on a level five without ever like leaving the house? No, not really. Like you have to go out there. You have to put things into action. You can't just read about it, though, of course, a large part of understanding information is reading about it. So again, it's about the right amount of reading with the right amount of doing, the right amount of consuming with the right amount of doing, and finding the right ratio is specific to you as a person. So I can't tell you what worked for me. It's not going to work for you. I can only tell you what kind of worked for me in a way that maybe your brain goes, okay, maybe this will work for me too, right? Same thing with monks who just do, but they never really examine themselves or learn about the world outside their bubble. Like it's all well and good to call yourself a monk, but do you really know much about the world if you're still in like this little micro bubble, right? Why is that? There's a, there's a quite a complex psychological thing because there's a certain type of person who is like a self-development junkie, but they never self-develop. Yeah. <laughs> they go to all the conferences. They and those people are the people who can quote the books, who reference like, oh my God, I love Grant Cardone. Oh my God, I love him. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, ew. Like this obsession is sort of the point. Like I see your obsession with the bubble. You've pedestaled these people. And now you're like, this person saved my life. This person didn't do anything. This person gave you a tool and you utilized it. 
you watch all the videos, they've got, you know, they can they they know all the words, but they they don't actually put anything into action. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of subtlety, but the craziest thing is that see, anytime we engage in some kind of self-help kind of thing, it actually is a coping mechanism to deal with some negativity within us. So let's say that I feel like I'm lazy. So then my mind looks looks at me and says, okay, I'm lazy, I need to do something about it. And then it's really tricky, right? Because you, you have your brain sees two options. One is that I can do something hard, or the other is I can do something easy. And we have to understand this, the brain has evolved to be lazy. The brain- This is so important. Brain has evolved, laziness is efficiency. We want to get the most yield out of the smallest investment. Mm -hmm. So then what happens is our brain is like, okay, I could like go to the gym or I could watch a video about working out. And if I watch a video about working out, I will be more efficient when I go to the gym. There are all kinds of scams. But then you never go to the gym. So what I do is I watch working out videos while I work out. I listen to like music that I really like while I'm working out. I do... Like I give myself, because the dopamine I get from just watching a working out video feels like I worked out. So I'm like, nah, 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 Brittany. So I work out with the video, whether I'm doing the same exercises or not, I'm just listening to it because I love working out videos. But I also notice that when I watch them, I feel like I worked out and I didn't. So I want to make sure that I'm doing that. Like today when I do leg day, I listen to Chloe Bailey because that's what I'm listening to right now on repeat. And she's got a couple of songs that are perfect for squats. And so I've been doing squats to like her music and that's really good. But then if I turn on a video that's informative, I just want to make sure that it's not making me think I've done more than I have. Actually activate parts of our brain that make us feel like we're making progress without actually making progress. Mm-hmm. That's how you become a self-developed junkie or self-help junkie. On this point of psychotherapy not being perfectly designed for men, I was watching a clip before you arrived um, where a lady who's an author of a, a book that's just come out said that talking about our problems makes them worse. And I was wondering if that's true. It can be. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a big problem, is that talking about our problems can absolutely make things worse. So okay. Before they get into this, I just want to specify this is I really believe there's a difference between complaining and venting because venting is like when you're like, I need to get this off my chest and then I'm going to go take care of it. Complaining is like, I'm going to talk about this thing and never do anything to fix it. And I don't want to hear you complain. I am a solutions based person. So you can vent to me. But if you complain at me and I see you not making an effort to change the situation, I'm going to say, OK, it's enough. It's enough. Like, I can't listen to you talk about this ever again. Now, maybe you've been this friend. Maybe you know this friend who lets you, like, who listens to you loop on something for six months until you figure it out. There is a difference between looping on something. And I don't mean in some psychological term. I just mean in general, like, repeating the same thing. And you di diving deeper and deeper into a subject matter layer by layer, which might sound like you're just looping, but you're actually getting somewhere. And you've got to be able to get somewhere. Like there's got to be, I got to see uh, productivity. Like I got to see you make a difference every time you talk about the same thing. Because after a while, now you're just getting the satisfaction of saying it out loud, but never doing anything. And I don't want to be a part of that. It's why sometimes I think this is going to correlate better when we talk about friendships in a video after this. This is the dilemma with knowing if you're in a healthy situation with somebody or not, is are they coming to you because they genuinely need you to listen and they just need someone to hear them? Or are they coming to you to misuse the intimacy and time between you to complain about something they're never going to do anything about? And this is why being an adult is so difficult because you're always asking yourself, which one am I dealing with? Which one am I dealing with? And what's worse is what if they don't listen? You ever hear your friend tell a story and you're like about to yes girl her and then you're like, oh my God, my friend's the bad guy in the story. Oh my God, my friend is the bad guy in the story. And that's a really hard place to be in when you're listening to somebody who's like, oh, can I tell you about something? And you're like, yeah. And you're ready to be on their side. And then when they start talking, you're like, oh no. And then you're like sitting there like, how do I tell my friend that they deaf the bad person in the story? Because that is, that is like, oh my God. That is a, you know what I'm saying? That's a, ooh. Like I just feel everything inside of me is like, ooh. Oh no, <laughs> chat says this just happened to me. Oh no, it is, it is, I could not even, and I'm just in here like, oh no, I have to tell them. And then you tell them, and look, I'm the friend that will tell you. I'm the friend who's like, hey, 
can I be real with you? And usually they know like, oh, Brittany's about to say something. Like, can I be real with you? And then I tell them. And it is one of those things where I'm like, you know, maybe we should, you know, double think what we're doing or like be able to see a therapist maybe. And the problem is like, it's always dependent on your friend taking the advice. They don't have to, but sometimes they turn around and then blame you. I've also had that happen. Okay. Like you tell somebody like, Hey, I think something's going on with you. And they're like, no, something's going on with you. <laughs> You're like, Oh fuck. And like, that's why you have to have people in your life. You really trust to call you out on your bullshit. And again, you have to trust yourself enough, even past those people, but it's good to have somebody who you have really good faith with. And the dilemma with that is it takes a really strong sense of intimacy of knowing, and they have to practice their prejudice and bias, like fighting their prejudice and bias. Like when I go to my religious brother for advice, he is able to remove his bias and prejudice from our lifestyle differences and give me advice that makes sense within my bubble. That doesn't mean his advice is always perfect, but it means that he's at least able to do that, which other people cannot do as well because they're, they're too wrapped up in sort of like their prescriptions, I think, right? Let's understand a couple of things. So the first is that there's this assumption that talking about your problems makes them better, but they're actually very specific things that need to happen in order for talking about your problems to make things better. The most important thing is something called an emotional catharsis. So this is where you have like a breakthrough in therapy. So there's like this moment where there's a lot of dormant stuff, and Freud even described this, where you have this moment of very, very intense emotion that is relatively new I mean, it's kind of dormant, but it's not like venting. We'll get to venting in a second. And so there, there's a particular way we have to talk about problems that triggers emotional catharsis. Mm, this is so key. This is so key. And it, it's so different too when your problems go from being sort of like kids' problems, which could be intense or not, to like adult problems, which could be intense or not. It's like sometimes just talking about it is enough for a problem that's not so deep. And then sometimes it is. And then sometimes you talk too much sometimes you can't talk about your problems because it makes it worse. Sometimes you should just fix your problems. Chat says this might be the difference between those friends who are your tribe and those friends who are friends. I would like to think that, but I think given my lived experience, even my inner circle and I will have these conversations of conflict where you're talking to inner circle and you're realized like, oh, I think you're the bad guy in the story, but you're like, let's fix that. And then they get defensive and prideful. I think not everybody wants to hear you say something to them, whether it's your mom or your dad or your sibling or your, you know, whoever, even your spouse is capable of being defensive. And so you need to sort of have the ability to have hard conversations and still come back. Like I was just thinking today how much I've like yelled at my siblings and been like, oh my God, you little bitch. And they're like, you're a little bitch. And then like 10 minutes later, we're like dancing in the kitchen. Like we're like fighting and then we're like yelling. And then like 10 minutes later, we're all like, you know what I mean? It's just like sibling stuff. Cause like you've lived together your whole life. You're like, I changed your diaper. I literally have changed your poopy diapers. Don't even lecture me right now. Even if you are seven feet taller than me. And then you sitting there and it's like not a big deal. But that's also because of all the shared history. That doesn't mean your sibling is ready to face themselves. It doesn't mean like they're ready to have the conversation about how they can be better or how they can change. And sometimes you just got to be patient and love your sibling through the process. And maybe that's just speaking as somebody with nine siblings, nine whole people, you know, it just takes some time for everyone to go on their individual journey. I don't want people to feel like if you're really my friend, you'll never fight with me. No, sometimes friends fight, but I don't think that should be in the end of our friendship. I personally don't think fighting with my friends should be the end. I don't think my friends have to be perfect. I don't think to be my real friend, you have to show up for me every time I need you. I understand you're going through your own shit. I understand you're going through your own problems. I would never ask my friend to be inhuman, like inhuman, like to be superhero. I want my friend to be my friend. If you're going through a spot of depression, if you need six months off from this friendship to go like do your journey, like I'm here for that. I'm not gonna ask my friend to show up to every birthday party, every child's christening, Every tax appointment, you know, when they're going through their own life, when they're doing their own things. I saw this um, this whole, like, situation with a friendship where basically this friend was like, I want you to come to my birthday party. And the other friend was like, hey, I'm kind of, like, in a depressed era of my life. Like, I can't get out of the house right now. And that other friend's like, I can't believe you're not going to show up for my birthday party. And I was like, I'm sorry, did you miss the part where they said they were depressed? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, hello, your friend's in a depressed era. They don't need to come to your 
birthday party it happens every year it's also just a birthday party relax and also i'm sorry like as we get into adulthood you know what i'm saying like that idea of like it's my special day girl go to therapy you're an adult do you need a special day like can you just give yourself a special day i'm sorry maybe that's me being like the brain that i am i couldn't imagine asking my friends to come to my special day while they're like depressed and wanting to die hi can you come to my special day i just couldn't i would never ask like you go be depressed girl love you i'll see you when i see you girl so when we're having like these conversations i think sometimes there's just so many layers to it it's hard to know what expectations of real friends we should have or what expectations of social situations like how should they happen oh if your parents really loved you they loved that you were gay oh if your sister really loved you she'd be able to listen to you on the phone 10 hours a day if your best friend really loved you they'd show up across the like come on guys you're putting so much pressure on people just because of what a label a title just ask people where they're at and what they're capable of doing and do that. Chat says I had a friend who would drop and block me every time we had a disagreement. Oh my God, we're often on again friends for 11 years before realizing this friendship was toxic. No, ma'am. See, that stuff is so strange to me. How are we like dropping each other, you know, over and over again, over like disagreements? Like I couldn't even imagine. And look, my strongest friendship is literally over 20 years old. We've been friends since we were nine and I do not see us slowing down anytime soon. And we've managed through ups and downs, like my ugliest stages, her ugliest stages. We have been there through thick and thin, no matter what sins we've committed, whatever, we have held each other accountable, called each other out, loved each other, cried in each other's arms, and we are still gonna go strong. We are absolutely gonna grow old together because we both make an effort even when it's uncomfortable, to always stay in contact, to always say, hey, I'm going to take a break, but I'm going to come back. Because at the end of the day, that's what unconditional love is, is I need a break, but I'm going to come back. And I am grateful every day that like she's still in my life and I still get text messages every day from her and we still message all the time and we're always sending each other Instagram memes because girls, sometimes when workloads be too heavy, all you have is an Instagram meme. And you know what? It's good enough on a friendship that's over 20 something years old. Because it's that strong. It's so strong that I call her parents to catch up. It's so strong that when I talk to my mom, she asks how she doing. Oh, how's the bestie doing? She's doing good. Because that's how a part of this person's life we've been, you know? And that's it. So again, like, it's okay that your friends need a break. But your friends also have to make sure that they know where they stand in the friendship and that they can come back. I think sometimes there's this, like, fear of, like, I can't go back now. I was so mean to them. You can always come home. That's why I tell my siblings, I don't care how big a tantrum you throw, you can always come home. There will be boundaries, but you can always come home. Chat says, what about if someone doesn't explicitly say that they are depressed, but you know something is going on? I think people are allowed their privacy. So if you go to your friend and be like, hey bro, I'm just checking, like, you good? How are you? I'm just checking in. I feel like I haven't heard from you in a bit, something like that. And then say like, if you wanna tell me, great. If you don't wanna tell me, great. I just wanna let you know I'm here. And I think it's that. Because even if you think something's going on, people are allowed their privacy, but give them a space to share and give them a safe reassurance that they can share. Let's see, a friend over 10 years dropped me because I got a boyfriend and I don't miss that person. Okay, and hear me out. I've known some people for 20 years that are not close friends. And I wouldn't mind if they dropped me because dropping me just feels like we're going our own way. Like I've known people for 10, 15, 20 years. I've known a lot of the same people most of my life. And I would not be offended if a lot of those people stopped talking to me. And I think what happens is, one-sided relationships get a little awkward or people feel a certain way or people don't know like where is the line in the friendship and that's why you just have to negotiate all the time which feels exhausting but truthfully unless you're inner circle there's a lot of variation of the probability of those people staying in your life unless you're inner circle like I couldn't imagine guaranteeing that I would be in anyone's life because I just don't have any reason to think that would be true. I'm open to it of course because life might go that way but statistically prob like probability wise you, those people are not going to be in your life. I mean, there are people who don't talk to their parents or siblings, don't consider them inner circle. If you think, like, if humans aren't going to talk to their own blood, then, of course, they're going to come in and out of, like, chosen family. And even chosen family is kind of a loaded term now because people are like, that's my chosen family. But if you ask that person, they don't feel the same. You know what I mean? And also, like, the way I love somebody doesn't mean that that's how they feel about me. Like if I feel like I really love this person unconditionally, their inner circle in my head, it doesn't mean they feel the same way, but it's also not my worry if they're in my life. Like if I love someone unconditionally, like one of my siblings, but they're like, I never want to talk to you again. That's fine. I mean, you can't take away that I unconditionally love you, but I respect you enough to never reach out again. Like I don't believe in reaching out if a person walks away from you. I think it's a consent violation. 
they have to reach out to me. So if one of my siblings was like, I'm never talking to you again, I'd be like, I respect this. I love you. Your inner circle always like you can always come home, but also like I won't reach out. So reach out if you need to, but I love you. And I will, I will respect this decision you've made, right? Because like, who am I to tell that person? You're my sibling. You have to stay in touch with me. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. But that's hard because in the world we go, that's my sister. I can't believe my sister did that to me. I can't believe my brother did that to me. Are your, are your siblings not their own people? I can't believe my mom did that to me. Bro, I don't know how to tell you this, but they're, the own, they're their own people. And they can do whatever they need to do to keep their peace. You know? Oh, yes, Jess says I agree, but so many people get upset because they want you to reach out to them as if to prove something, but that's on them. Oh, I don't chase, girl. I had a friend like that who, and I would tell them, don't ever play this game with me because I will never message you again. So if you play a game with me where you're like, hey, I'm mad at you. Can you tell me why? (laughs) Girl, you better go to therapy. If they're like, hey, I'm pretty upset. You hurt my feelings. I was wondering if you realized you hurt my feelings. And I'm like, no, I didn't realize that. What did I do? And they're like, well, can you guess? (laughs) Girl, you better go to therapy. If they're like ignoring me and walking away and they expect me to chase, girl, bye. Like, I love you. I am not going to chase you go to therapy i am a securely attached person i don't need your like whatever that attachment style is girl i don't need it i don't play yes exactly never play guess the guessing game i don't play the guessing game and i don't chase it with peace and love i wish you the best but i'm not going to chase you and if you think love is being chased after you throw a tantrum go to therapy could you imagine an adult person being like if they're really my best friend they'll definitely chase me Um, ma'am, absolutely not. It's like, that's why I see that toxicity in couples. And I'm like, break up, bro. Throw a tantrum, be passive aggressive, not even talk to your guy all day and then expect him to chase you. Girl, no, (sighs) ma'am. With peace and love, absolutely not. I'm gonna make my person work this hard. See, I think I just want, want more communication from my friends. I get upset when they ghost me and then... The comeback, no explanation because it feels pretty one-sided, but that's just me right now. Hey, that's fair. I think everyone has an awkward stage in all friendships. I've had them. I've been a bad friend. I've been a good friend. Like I've been, I've had to learn how to be a better friend. Obviously we all do. This idea that we're born with an understanding of how to be a good friend. If only girl, please get your head out of your ass. None of us are born knowing how to be anything. We are literally blank slates. Well, hardly blank if you consider genetics, but we're born into the world and we figure out through trial and error And sometimes being a bad friend, sometimes being a bad partner, how to be a better one. The thing, though, is that we're all kind of responsible for how things go, but it's it's not as personal. It doesn't have to be the end of the world because somebody's not your friend anymore. It can be sad, but it doesn't have to be the end of the world. You don't have to harbor anxiety or bitterness because somebody doesn't want to be your friend. Like, do we believe in consent or not? Like, do we believe in consent or not? People can consent to stop being friends. Now, if they do this, if they're like, I don't want to be your friend anymore because they actually want you to chase them. Um, bye, girl. Bye, bitch. Bye, bitch. Bye, bitch. You know what I'm saying? Like if somebody literally is like, I don't want to be your friend, but like they're kind of hoping you literally message them like, hey, I know you said you didn't want to be friends, but I'm kind of hoping you were just mad that day. No. No. Okay. Let's continue this video. Emotional catharsis creates something called like a breakthrough. So this is also like an experience. So this is not just talking about my problems. This is experiencing my problems in a different way. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of like touching the hot pan. Mm -hmm. Usually it's kind of painful. So when we're doing like work with a trauma survivor, we don't want to just talk about the trauma. We want to sort of dig into it a little bit more and have an emotionally healing experience. Um, the, the real problem is that sometimes what will happen is people will just talk about their problems. So they'll use therapy as essentially like a venting session. Okay, and this is people who go to therapy and do it wrong. So when I say go to therapy, I don't mean just go to therapy, girls. I mean actually utilize the tool of therapy to be introspective enough to get to the next stage. Use the tool from therapy and then move on. I don't care if it's one session or 20 sessions. Use however many sessions you need to get the tool you need to be, to change your life. Because I don't need you, when I say go to therapy, I don't mean go to therapy and complain about how your friend told you to go to therapy. I mean, go to therapy because the tool you need isn't something I can give you as a friend. 
Can you imagine coming to your friends in 2024 and expecting them to know how to be a therapist to you? Girl, this is in the 90s where our parents smoke cigarettes and drink, you know, beer and figured out what to do with their lives because they talk to their besties. Are we going to break generational curses? If we're going to break generational curses, you got to go to professionals. Okay, we got to talk to the professionals. And I think professionals come in all shapes and sizes, but ultimately, like your best friends are not your doctors. We have got to like recontextualize venting to our friends and remember that like venting is great. But you got to do the work going to your therapist and venting is great, but you still got to do the work. And venting, if we look at kind of the neuroscience of venting, venting is useful for reducing our negative emotion in the moment. But this is the really tricky thing. If we kind of think about it, you know, like I'll ask you, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But why do we have negative emotions, Stephen? It's a signal. For what? It, I, I, would, I would guess that it depends on the negative emotion, but I guess it's a signal that is there to help us connect with people. So, oh, okay, so let's, I, like I think like it can lo be, sure. Loneliness. Loneliness is a great example yeah. of a signal that's designed to connect with you. What about something like anger or fear? Why do we have fear? To warn us against an impending danger. Absolutely, right? So if I'm like running through the jungle and I see a tiger, and I have fear, fear gives us information, and what else does it do? Gives us a physiological energy and Very good. adrenaline. Absolutely, for what purpose? To flee. Absolutely. So this is a big thing that people don't understand. The primary motivator for change is actually negative energy. Mm, negative mm, 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 mm. This is so good. This is why I say to be introspective is difficult because you do have to face an ugliness within you. You have to face your evil. And that is really hard because it's negative. And people don't want to be in the negative headspace. They want to be in the positive headspace. So they cope and they fake positivity. I'm so positive. I believe in you. You're so beautiful. Everyone is special. Everyone is great. And it's like, we don't want to face ourselves. We don't have that relationship with the self in that particular way. And this is why it is so difficult. This is why I, I shared a little TikTok, a little Instagram meme, I mean, on my story. And it was like, if you have to like break your muscles or tear your muscles for them to grow, why wouldn't you need to tear your mind? The dilemma is some people end up becoming insane because they haven't grounded themselves. They're not grounding themselves through the process of growing. If you're working out of the gym and you're getting really toxic with it and you're not giving yourself a chance to sleep or recover, then all of that working out is for nothing. Same thing with the mind. If you're being, quote, introspective and you're having a relationship with yourself, but you're breaking down your sanity and you're going insane, all of it is for nothing. So let's go, girls. If we're working out of the gym, we're also sleeping eight hours. We're also drinking enough water and getting enough protein. And I know it's difficult. Trust me, as somebody who like measures all her protein, it is never enough. But I'm going to have these muscles grow. So help me. Okay. Same thing with introspection. Introspection, we want to see growth. We don't want to see stagnation or God forbid insanity. The brain, it's a powerful little tool, but it's also fickle. Where do you think spiritual psychosis and all these things end up coming from? You're playing with your brain. You're playing with your mind. You're convincing yourself something is true when it's not. And boom, now you think trees can hug you in the middle of the forest. So this is the problem with venting. If you vent and get rid of all of your negative emotional energy, the drive to change will disappear. So if we kind of think about it, what motivates you the most? It's actually negative emotion. And you can literally look at the like the neuroanatomy of things like the amygdala. So Which is sort of why I think a Vegeta and Endeavor as characters are more relatable than a Goku uh, or, or like a, even a Luffy. Cause like they get, Go Goku and Luffy get stronger because it's fun. Cause they wanna be strong. But also technically Goku did reach Super Saiyan because Krillin was killed by Frieza. So technically it was a negative emotion that pushed him to the next level. But Vegeta and Endeavor, are also stagnated by their burdens of pride. So technically their negative also is stagnation. Ooh, it's about that balance. Sometimes too much positivity stagnates and then sometimes too much negativity stagnates. You gotta have the right amount of both to get to the next level. Okay, okay. Mm, good point, Brittany. Great point, me. <laughs> so the amygdala is very close to the hippocampus, which is where learning and memory happen. So we actually learn the most through negative emotions. So if, I, if, I'm, if I've been happily married for 15 years and there's infidelity, 
right? One case of infidelity. The negative emotion from that one case of infidelity can drastically motivate me. So one of the biggest problems that I see is that we try to get rid of our negative emotions, and in doing so, we actually hamstring our motivational capability. So the, I've seen this a lot, where people will come in and they'll go through like what they think therapy is, which is like, actually same, same guy, Mike, came in and he'd like kind of talk about his problems. And I was like, bro, I was like, Mike, is this helping? So I was still a trainee at the time. So I, he'd been seeing me for about six, eight months. And I was like, you come in here and you kind of talk about your problems. But like, you're, you don't seem to be getting better. I didn't know how to do therapy at the time. And then he's like, isn't that what I'm supposed to do is come mm. in and talk about my problems? I was like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I was a second year psychiatry resident, but I was like, is this helping? He's like, no. And I was like, okay, we got to do something else then. Coming in and just venting is not actually psychotherapy. That's not like, so. Thank you. Okay. So when you book a call with me and you call me and we're shooting the shit about anime, congratulations. You're not getting therapy. No one knows what therapy is if they think I'm doing therapy. And just again, I just am finding a way to fund my content. Reminder that I'm a content creator who wants to make the content happen. You guys make the content available and constant because I can do it full time because it's getting funded, right? Like that's why I show up to work every day to fund the content. So again, like people have to remember that everything we're doing it's not as simple as like therapy isn't just as simple as talking about your feelings. That's like the meme. The meme is we're talking about our feelings, right? And that's not what's happening. And so again, I love this conversation. You guys should watch it on your own. That's all we need to watch today for the sake of this conversation. So I'll go ahead and link the rest in the chat. You guys check out the full conversation. It's really, really good. But the thing that stands out to me is knowing what something actually is actually working to get better and making sure you're doing the right things with the right tools because otherwise you're never going to grow and that stagnation is going to feel rewarding without the actual growth. And then 30 years will pass and you'll be like, why am I in the same spot even though I felt like I was doing something? Because feeling like you're doing something isn't it. But so many of humans, and look guys, we are evolved animals on a planet, in my opinion. You're going to die. We're all going to die. In a thousand years, we're just going to be another part of the population no one remembers. So you actually don't have to do anything. There's no reason for you to invest in your life, except that you can. And if you would like, while you are alive, to have a good relationship with yourself, you can. That's the only reason you do it, because you want to. And if you don't want to, girl, you don't have to. No one's going to remember you. You're not even going to remember you. You're probably going to be 90 with Alzheimer's. You're not even going to remember you. So you don't have to do anything. I really recommend doing it though, because I personally feel it really radically changed my relationship with life. And I think my life is way better now doing what I want every day than what it was before, which is never knowing what I wanted or only wishing I could have what I want. And now that I have it, yeah, it's better. Life is better now that I got what I wanted. But also I had to do a lot of work to get it. And I still have to do work to maintain it. So the work never stops, which is again, a part of the problem because, oh my God, if the work never stops, why am I doing it? Because it's worth it. Because it's worth it. <clears throat> Chat says, how do you distinguish between actually knowing you are doing something versus feeling like you were doing something? Results. You are data. The data shows results. Um... Mike, uh, bald Mike, the gym Mike, uh, Mike, 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 I forget his name on YouTube. Somebody asked him, how do I know I'm gaining muscle? You know, it's a funny question to ask. Like, how do I know I'm actually working out? How do I know that I'm actually gaining muscle? Uh, you'll see it. Now, if you can't see it because you're having a little bit of body dysmorphia, then you take a picture, post it on Instagram and everyone talks about how big your muscles are. And that helps. People will see it even if you don't. And that's the data you're getting back. And that's why in some ways I'm getting assessed for autism because I got enough feedback from the world saying like, hey, you remind me of me and I'm autistic. And hey, I think you might be autistic. And hey, I'm gonna assume you have, you're have you autistic. And I'm like, oh, I should probably go get that checked because the world keeps telling me I got crazy ass muscles and I can't see them. So maybe I just can't see myself clearly but now that you say that, I think I did notice that I've been looking pretty good in my clothes. I think, I think you're right. I did start to note, you know what I'm saying? I'm just giving you an example. It's not literally a one-to-one, -one, but I'm just trying to give you an example. The idea is that you're data. And so if you think you're doing something, but you're not seeing the results, then, you know, 
You're not really doing anything. Now give yourself the proper amount of time to see those results. And I think that's what's hard. Because what takes someone a week to see results could take someone six months. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Then